but yes, uh, welcome uh, this evening to the the first of two events as part of this year's 2023-2024 uh, uh, annual Russell Family Research Fellowship in Religion and Science. Uh, tonight is the public forum portion, and uh, tomorrow, uh, noon to five uh, Pacific time, is the research conference part. Uh, that event is uh, hybrid. We'll be in the boardroom, the dinner boardroom on the third floor of the GTU Hewlett Building, uh, if you'd like to join us in person, or you can register uh, on our website uh, and, and join us virtually. We'll have some virtual uh, respondents uh, from other parts of the country and some respondents in person as well. But tonight, uh, we're going to focus on what Brian is going to tell us about uh, technology. So this year's fellow is Dr. Brian Patrick Green, who is the Director of Technology Ethics at the Markula Center for Applied Ethics at Santa Clara University, where he also teaches uh, AI ethics in their Graduate School of Engineering. Uh, Brian is widely published, has done work for both uh, the Vatican in the, in the Dicastery for Education and Culture, as well as consulting with uh, uh, companies in Silicon Valley. Again, widely published. If you'd like full accolades, you'll have to wait till tomorrow uh, to hear a longer bio, uh, or you can check out our website. Uh, but tonight, for now, I'll just say that um, Brian is a longtime friend uh, of the center uh, and a friend. We were both here at the GTU and the PhD program together. I'm just thrilled to have him as this year's fellow. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to what he's going to say uh, tonight and tomorrow. Tonight's topic is, should God have given human, humans technology, considerations of nuclear weapons, space technologies, synthetic biology, and artificial intelligence? Uh, the floor is yours, Brian. Braden, thank you so much. All right, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully everything will work out well by doing that. How does this look? Does it look all right? Looks fine to me. All right, in that case, I will proceed. So basic question, should God have given humans technology? Um, and we we might think to ourselves, well, first of all, who, cho who chose this? Nobody chose it, right? It's just something that happened. Um, and what does it really mean, right, to have technology? So let's just start uh, thinking about uh, some of these things. So technology, it must be worth the risk, right? Uh, of course, some human thought that technology was worth the risk, but what I mean is that God must have thought that technology was worth the risk. After all, God made a universe in which these technologies were possible, uh, including the iPhone, for example, but of course, many other technologies besides just that. So then we have to ask ourselves, though, but do we think it's really worth the risk? Um, maybe God made a mistake. Uh, why not have a world without fission, fissionable isotopes, for example? We could maybe have a world where uranium-235 existed, but it didn't have quite the right uh, properties, um, or pl where plutonium-239 had slightly different properties, where, where fission, using them as an efficient weapon was no longer possible. Rocketry also, for example, could be made impossible if the Earth had higher gravity or a slightly thicker atmosphere. Um, or at least very economically problematic, maybe still possible, but uh, economically very difficult. And also other technologies that are coming, for example, artificial intelligence and synthetic biology. Um, are there things that could have been changed to prevent these other very dangerous technologies from being possible? And we might also think to ourselves that we once had a world without these things, um, but really that was because we lacked the name for them and we lacked the knowledge and understanding of what these things were. It's not because they could not exist, it's because humans had not yet created them. And so we might think to ourselves, well, perhaps ignorance is bliss, um, perhaps weakness has some benefits then. But we can also remember, of course, that the past was not that safe of a place, um, but the type of, or the non-safety of it actually differed in scale. Um, we often, almost always, we create technologies in order to make ourselves safer, even if we're creating a weapons technology or other dangerous technology, we create those things in order to make ourselves feel safer. And yet, at the same time, we end up making ourselves less safe. Um, the Bible indicates that God set us on this path towards technology after a certain incident involving fruit. And so we might ask ourselves, is there anything to learn from that? And so we'll explore this a little bit more right now. So Adam and Eve, they're in the garden. Uh, they're being told to till and to keep the garden. That's back in Genesis. 
And we might ask ourselves, would they have used tools doing this? Um, so, you know, trying to till and keep a garden with your bare hands is not easy. So we can, I think, assume that they were using some sort of tool. Um, and at the same end, of course, when they discover that they're naked, they it says that they sewed together leaves. So they have at least some some very basic uh, technological understanding um, at the point where this incident happens. And so we might also notice that there's a trajectory to the Bible. It goes from a garden in Genesis 2 and 3, and it ends in a flying cubic heavenly city in Revelation 21. And now, <laughs> this is very science fiction, I have to say. When I, I can't imagine what people in the past exactly thought about this when they were reading this thing in the Bible. The New Jerusalem is a giant flying cube, 1,500 miles on each side, which is very strange when you think about it. Um, there's, there's, you know, obviously, you know, there's metaphors and all other sorts of things in here. We shouldn't take these things too literally. But at the same time, there's something interesting going on here. And of course, there's a technological advance just in the idea of moving from a garden to a city. Um, so technology is at least not condemned by that. The Bible also begins in watery chaos. It ends with the sea being no more in Revelation. Chaos is eliminated. In other words, if water represents chaos, then there's chaos at the beginning. And at the end, there is no more. Um, and of course, uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 20 also talks about this. There are no moths or rust in heaven. Um, exactly how chemistry changes in this uh, particular way, I'm not sure. You know, no more oxidation. Not, I don't understand how that works. Um, Bob probably has some insights on this, um, and perhaps you can enlighten us later. Um, or perhaps, you know, it's all metaphor, right? So one of technology's primary goals, however, is to reduce chaos, if you want to think of it that way, and increase certainty. There's something uh, about technology that we always generally create technology in order to increase order or work against entropy, um, unless it's some sort of destructive technology, in which case it, you know, completely obliterates something by exposing it to so much energy that it disintegrates. And so, once again, we might ask ourselves, why did God set humanity on this path? The God of the Bible is not like the Greek gods. In Genesis, God kind of takes the place of Prometheus, which is kind of interesting. God wants humans to have technology. Um, technology is given as a gift after a terrible mistake happens. Um, and we might ask ourselves, why are we given a gift after a mistake? You know, there's a curse involved in this um, where God, you know, condemns us to labor and all that sorts of stuff. But then there's this gift given at the same time, which uh, once again sets us on a trajectory, which has come to where we are at this point in history. So there's something going on here. Okay, there's too much text on this slide. I apologize. Adam and Eve tried technology and they needed help. Guess what? Leaves are terrible for clothing. Uh, they're not comfortable. They're not durable. They're not warm. I don't care what kind of leaves you have. If you try to sew them together, um, you're not going to get great clothing out of it. Now, you can take those leaves and treat them like flax or something like that, turn them into fibers, and then weave the fibers together. But that's a very complicated process, and that's not what the story says happened. Um, and, of course, all the time we do have to ask ourselves how much uh, of this mythological story uh, is pure meaning as opposed to fact. You know, it's mostly meaning and uh, not so much fact. But uh, diving into it, I think there's just kind of an inexhaustible supply of meaning, which is really fascinating. So that kind of leaf clothing, maybe that works for Eden. Uh, the real world is a harsh place, though. Leaves aren't good enough. So God gives them an extra layer of skin to go over their skin, uh, animal skin clothing. In Genesis 3, humans were not allowed to eat animals, uh, so there would have been no skins as byproducts of the animal meat production process. Um, but, you know, God comes up with these animal skins from somewhere, doesn't say where they come from, um, and uh, hands them over and says, here, here's something better for you. Uh, nice warm furs, luxurious, but always with the knowledge that something has gone terribly wrong, that this, uh, this clothing that's been gifted uh, represents a, a loss in some way rather than a gain. Now, just in the next chapter of Genesis, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in terms of technology. Um, Adam and Eve and their descendants improve their technological skills dramatically in just one chapter, um, and also not very many generations either. So it's a kind of interesting compression of lots and lots of history. So Abel keeps flocks. What does that imply? Domestication of animals. Uh, Cain works the soil. That indicates that there's all this agricultural technology going on there in terms of plowing, seeding, selective breeding of crops. Uh, really a lot of complexity. 
you know, a few verses later, Cain's building a city. This implies all sorts of other technological stuff in terms of building structures, access to materials, transportation technologies, and things like that. And then, you know, a couple of verses later, we have Jabal. He was the father of those who live in tents and raise livestock. Notice that he's kind of continuing in Abel's uh, path there by keeping livestock and flocks. And then there's Jabal. He was the father of all who play stringed instruments and pipes. Uh, we often don't think about the fact that music is an extremely technological uh, endeavor. There's a just a lot of technology involved in music, you know, especially now, but even in the past, it was it was really one of the ways of pushing forward technology in a lot of ways was through music. And of course, Tubal Cain forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. So this is showing that the technology has already advanced all the way to the Iron Age just by the end of chapter four. Of course, the flood happens, the watery chaos strikes back. Um, so it's not just a straight trajectory forward, right? There's also bad things that happen. Um, however, notably here, Noah's Ark is a big technological artifact. Um, God and says how to build it, hey, do this, and then humans build it, and it saves humanity. So there's some sort of salvific element to technology here, which is really worth keeping in mind, um, especially at the place that we are in history, where we need to think about big picture technologies uh, either harming or helping us. So technology can oppose the power of chaos, while at the same time can also be involved in creating a chaos. And if you, of course, continue through um, the narrative in the Old Testament, you get to the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel is a big piece of technology. Uh, humans are using it to compete with God, and they are punished for that. Um, but, of course, positive depictions of artifacts also show up a lot, especially holy artifacts get a lot of discussion. Um, if you look at the tabernacle, the vestments, the Ark of the Covenant in Exodus, a full one quarter of the book of Exodus is devoted to describing artifacts which I think is significant. When you think about, you have the entire Bible and you're going to try to boil it down to the things that are really important, spending uh, such a large section of one of the first books of the Bible just describing artifacts is a pretty uh, interesting way to be spending your time, I would say. And of course, Solomon's Temple gets a certain number of chapters in the book of Kings, First Kings and Second Chronicles also. So we might also say that God is a technologist. We want to be extending metaphors. Um, and it's not just metaphorical. The language in the Bible actually indicates this to be the case. God is called an artificer or a technites in wisdom and in Hebrews. Jesus is a carpenter, a tecton or a tectonos in Mark and Matthew. Uh, and it, they serve to reinforce the idea of techne being not just good, but actually divine. There is some sort of divine element to this, which uh, I think is really worth pondering. And of course, we have all sorts of ancient drawings. So this would be Jesus drawing out, you know, what the world is going to look like. All right. Sorry, we have. Uh, there we go. So and then, of course, other pictures, Jesus with a carpenter. So these kind of woodworking tools and things like that are uh, quite important to think about kind of the physicality of the act of making. And one, one thing that uh, is worth thinking about also, I think, is the fact that when God creates, God creates by words, right? It's just a verbal action. That's the way the, the Bible describes it. When humans create, we actually have to go through an intermediary phase. We can't just speak and have things happen. We have to either speak at technology. Um, if we're going to talk to someone on our phone, for example, we can speak and talk to them through the technology. But really, it's fundamentally different than that. We have to have an artifact that we have created in order to make our words mean something. And so this physicality, physical intermediary becomes really important to think about too. So further into the New Testament, we get some interesting verses relating to action. So for example, thou art Peter and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is not a defensive promise. This is an offensive one. The church is going to go out, fight against evil, and win. So there's a activity level that's associated with this. Um, it's not just a resting on our laurels. It's actually telling us to go out and do something. Um, you shall know them by their fruits. True prophets are going to produce good actions in the world. Um, this is interesting because it kind of has a consequentialist element to it. Um, in other words, truth is what has real effects. It's not just words. And you could argue that this is... Uh, this is a kind of of uh, promoting almost a scientific worldview in some ways, which is test things 
see what actually happens in terms of activity. Don't just go by words alone. Actually go out there and see what happens if you test things. Don't uh, don't just listen to Aristotle, right? Just because Aristotle said a bunch of stuff doesn't mean he's right. Actually test to see if what Aristotle said was right. Also the idea of behold, I make all things new. It's a blessing on novelty. And that, of course, is crucial to invention. In the context in Revelation, of course, it's a very different context. But one of the fun things, of course, about biblical verses is that they get taken out of context all the time, and they can uh, provide uh, critical inspirations to people under certain circumstances. And also this idea of a call to greater things. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, do greater works than these. Uh, is of course an exhortation to great works. This uh, this uh, kind of promotion of ambition in a way, and it's a very particular kind of ambition. It's a it's an ambition to do great things to help people, to do to follow in Jesus' footsteps, and then do greater things than those, uh, which I think is particularly inspiring. So, humans need technology. Um, without technology, we're incomplete, and we can look at our hands and say, what is a hand for? What's a hand? The hands are for grasping things. Um, and, of course, when it grasps a thing, this is actually fascinating. These studies have been going on for years, so the one I'm showing here is fairly old. Um, they just took a monkey, they gave the monkey a tool, they had uh, some sort of sensors on their mo on their skull to look at them to see how they were using either uh, parts of their motor cortex that are associated with distal or proximal. And when they grasped the object and used it as a tool, they were going for more of the distal sort of neurons. And so indicating that they had actually mapped the tool onto their body, which is something that you can do if you're using a hammer. The hammer actually becomes like it's part of your body. That's why the reason you can hit the nail with it. If you don't do that mapping, there's no way you're gonna hit the nail with the hammer. It becomes extremely difficult to coordinate. So the idea that we pick up a tool and the tool becomes a part of us is actually pretty fascinating, I think. And this gets into all sorts of questions about biology. So we don't have, as human beings, we don't have sharp teeth, we don't have claws, we don't have warm fur, we don't have a strong sense of smell. And so lined up, of course, in those pictures there, I show a bunch of claws, I show a very furry cat, and I show a bloodhound. We exceed all of the things that we don't have by, making a tool for those things. So we have knives, for example. We have clothing, which is you know vastly superior to what this very furry cat can have. And we have sensors that a dog could never evolve. And uh, here's just a few examples here. You know, any sword is going to be vastly more powerful than any claw. Um, space suits, that cat's not going to survive on the moon, but by golly, humans can make space suits and we can survive on the moon if we have to. And a Geiger counter is nothing that would be easily evolved in nature. I'm not sure how you could evolve it exactly, detecting of ionizing radiation. And yet we can make that tool and we can turn it into a, a form of sensory input that we can uptake. We can turn it into you know, a meter that goes back and forth and something that makes an audible sound that we can hear. So these built-in tools, our human built-in tools are limited, um, but the upper limit of our power actually increases based on that, those limitations because we can take so many more things that are external to us and make them a part of us. So technology facilitates our adaptation to a dynamic environment. And this externalization or debiologification of bodily powers allows for a more rapid uh, development, which is really, I think, uh, something that sets humans apart. Um, Pope Francis in his encyclical Laudato Si put a word out there, which is rapidification, which is, it's a very you know easy word to say in Spanish, uh, makes sense to say it from in a, in, a, in the Spanish language. When we say it in English, rapidification sounds a little funny, but we still know what it means, which is that things are getting faster over time. And this is kind of uh, one of the fundamental things about humanity is that we're much faster than most of the rest of the biosphere. It's really only microbes that can keep up with us in terms of evolution, which is why, of course, COVID has been such a huge problem over the last few years. It keeps changing. AIDS as a virus also keeps changing. But uh, if you compare that to the evolution of, say, elephants or something like that, yes, elephants still evolve, but we don't have to worry about them evolving faster than we do. And even if they did evolve faster than we do, our technology can actually keep up with them, which is another fascinating thing, of course, related to the COVID virus, which is that it might evolve really fast, but we can evolve a, a vaccine for it almost as fast as it can evolve, which just shows how incredibly fast technology has gotten relative to the biosphere. We're starting to outcompete 
uh, or at least getting up to the same equivalent level of competition as some of the fastest evolving things in the biological world. And so this transition from biology uh, towards history brings us to uh, you know new ideas, what's going on here in this shift from biology to history. Now, I'm gonna skip most of history and just go straight up to Christianity. And this is a picture, this background picture here is from the Aidwine Psalter, which was made in the 900s. It was maybe, it's between I think 850 and, and 950 or something like that. Um, from kind of Northwestern Europe, I believe it was uh, either England or in uh, the Netherlands, you know, that kind of area. And there's a drawing in here when you get to Psalm, one of the Psalms where, you know, the enemies are plotting against you. And what do we see here? We see the righteous people with an angel on their side. They're sharpening their swords using a rotary grinding wheel. And the enemies, the bad guys on the other side, are you are sharpening their swords using a regular old whetstone, just a block. And so there's a difference in technology between these two sides here. And it associates divinity and holiness with higher technology. And it associates lack of divinity and unholiness with a lower level of technology. This is a really significant change in history. And I think it's really worth pondering. So St. Augustine back in the fifth century noted that technology progress was already happening and he had attributed that to divine providence so if you go to the city of god chapter 24 he talks about this technology is improving over time he had, it was already notable at his time in history and if we go back into history of course later than saint augustine and a little bit later than the Aidwine psalter we can look at france and england between 1100 and about 1350 and see some very interesting technological progress happening so the, there's a brotherhood called the bridge building brotherhood uh, and there are several bridges in France that were built by them in the 12th century. The founder of the Bridge Building Brotherhood was, he claimed that what happened is that he had a dream. And in this dream, uh, it said, put the cut waters on both sides of the bridge piers. Bridges before this point were built with a cut water on the front side. So they were pointy on the front and they were flat on the back. And what happens if you have a flat area on the back is it creates an area of low pressure and turbulence, which tends to rip away the foundation if you're in a in a very energetic environment, such as when a flood happens or something like that, it erodes away the back of the pier for the bridge and then the bridge collapses. Um, but if you make it pointy, you make that disappear. And you can actually see this if you go to Rome. Uh, I noticed this the last time I was in Rome. Uh, you can tell when the bridges were built by whether they had a cut water on the back side or only on the front. And uh, so it's kind of fascinating that way. You'll see some of them are flat backed and some of them are pointy backed. Um, and one other thing that, that the Bridge Building Brotherhood came up with as an innovation was they flattened the arches. So they recognized at this point in time that you didn't have to have a kind of hemispherical arch. You could go for a flatter level of arch. Now, there was lots of experimentation going on in the Gothic period in terms of arches. So we can understand how this has worked. And of course, you can even go back to the Pantheon in Rome, which is a relatively flat dome, although not completely flat. It's, it's pretty close to a hemisphere in a lot of ways. You just kind of get an optical illusion when you're down there on the ground. but uh, this kind of innovation was pretty remarkable and of course this uh, this particular engineering brother decided that this was divine inspiration or were, was it legendary was it his own ideas that he just was covering in a coating of divine inspiration we'll never know the answer to that question however it's a pretty interesting technological innovation that happened there now we can also go to saint albert the great who was called the doctor universalis uh, lived between about 1200 and 1280 he was responsible for all these, you know, kind of famous chemistry type things. So here's a picture of him. Uh, this is from a box of, I'm trying to remember, maybe a box of cigars or something like that, where they were celebrating famous chemists in France at some point, you know, probably over 100 years ago. I'm not sure exactly when this picture is from. But uh, this idea of, of uh, starting to experiment with your environment, testing things, setting up experiments, uh, taking alchemy out of just being the in the shadows something that was not respectable and really starting to make it a respectable discipline and changing it from alchemy into chemistry saint albert the great uh, in, uh, discovered the element arsenic for example and there are various other things that he did too he worked a lot in zoology and other sorts of things now one of the things that also happened in the medieval period was this kind of fascination with androids uh and they're actually literally called androides 
So um, in addition to studying zoology, experimenting in optics, isolating arsenic and other things, Albertus is also reputed to have produced a talking brazen head. In other words, it was made out of bronze and it could somehow speak. And through uh, these sorts of devices, however, are attributed to lots of medieval thinkers and lots of people, not just in Europe, but also in the Middle East and in other places around the world. Um, and of course, there's a legend about this that, uh, you know, one day uh, somebody was playing a, prick, a, a prank on St. Thomas Aquinas, and one of the brothers was in the room underneath and talking through a tube up through the brazen head, and then St. Thomas took a sledgehammer and smashed the thing because he didn't like it. <laughs> he thought it, you know, reputedly, he thought it was demonic or something like that. But in any case, it got smashed, which shows a little bit of the difference between St. Albert, who was the mentor, and uh, St. Thomas, who was the, uh, the uh, student. All right, if we want to go a little bit further ahead in time, we can come to Roger Bacon, uh, who is co called the Dr. Mirabilis because of some of the amazing things that he uh, observed, for example, and experimented upon. So he was an advocate of observation and experimentation. Once again, don't take people's word for it, actually do something. Um, so he was known with some renown as an alchemist and astronomer uh, in the field of optics. He discovered something which people had probably noticed before, but never bothered to take uh, interest in, which is that the speed of light and the speed of sound are not the same thing. They run at a different speed. And what happened was he was outside of town once and he saw the blacksmith hitting the hammer against the anvil. And he discovered that he saw it happen and then heard it. And based on that observation, he realized that the speed of sound and the speed of light are not the same speed. And this indicated that there was something very different and a very interesting phenomenon going on there. He's also the first European known to describe gunpowder. Uh, one of the interesting things that happened leading up to the with the uh, Great uh, Black Death was that in Oxford, um, leading up until that point, there were a group of four guys who were all priests um, or brothers or somehow associated with the clergy. And between about 1325 and 1350, these four guys, uh, Thomas Bradwardine, who is called the Doctor Profundus, uh, William Hatesbury, uh, Richard Swineshead, who was called the calculator, and John Dumbleton began mathematizing physics, um, which is a pretty important thing to have happen. Uh, it's one thing to mathematize geometry, because that's fairly obvious. If you're going to measure things on Earth, you can do that and measure things. But when you start noticing that physical phenomena follow mathematizable rules, that's a pretty huge discovery. And so they started discovering things like the mean speed theorem. And what they were doing is they were rolling balls down inclined planes and measuring the acceleration due to gravity and all these other sorts of interesting phenomena uh, with, when they started uh, mathematizing these things. And unfortunately, when the Black Death rolled around, it, it disrupted the culture so much that it basically ended what they were doing. So uh, Europe, uh, th they had pioneered these things, but in a lot of ways, what they had done was forgotten. But there is a lot of uh, memory of their experiments also. A lot of the things that are attributed to Galileo were actually pioneered by these guys before Galileo got back to the subject a few hundred years later. So the Baconian Revolution, really what happens that brings science out of the universities and out of from among the clergy and out into the, the real world, if you want to think about it that way, is that Francis Bacon said, or he thought to himself, or at least he recognized this, which is that if you can repeat something in a laboratory, it can also be repeated on the battlefield or in a factory. So if you make these discoveries and just hide them in the university and, and remark at them, that's one thing. It's you know exciting. It's interesting to learn new stuff. But there's actually a practical implication here beyond the theoretical. And that's what Francis Bacon was interested in. Um, and so science really came to serve politics and economics. And by doing that, politics and economics became very interested in science and technology. Uh, Francis Bacon, Bacon, of course, used some very colorful language about what he was doing to nature, vexing nature and torturing nature into telling us her secrets. So there is also this kind of uh, masculine <laughs> uh, tormenting of the feminine here, which is, of course, extremely critiquable, especially from our present uh, context. And of course, the political side of this is that technology for weapons develop out of this. And then economically speaking, technology for industry, and that produces money. This really started setting England on a trajectory towards the industrial powerhouse that it became just a short while later, a couple of centuries later. Anyway, this starts to raise a question. What exactly is technology and what is technology for? 
Now, if you look at the word technology, um, basically, uh, it, technology has to do with know-how. It's the technical skill for production. It literally, it means the study of rational production. So that's one side of technology. It's the skill side of it. But very often we talk about technology as being technological products or artifacts. Um, if you look back at the Greek, techne means artisanal or craft knowledge and skill. Once again, reason applied to production. Um, and the modern word, word is the study of rational production. And uh, like I said, it's very often, it, it really has the, the primary meaning as being the know-how, understanding how these things happen. But we always talk about it nowadays, or almost always, you know, 90 plus percent of the time, think about it in terms of technological artifacts. There's, of course, an interesting relationship between science and technology, which is that science aligns the human mind with the natural world, if you want to think about it that way, and technology aligns the natural world with the human mind. So there's kind of this reciprocity between the two of them. Or if you want to use it in a in kind of a different phrase, I don't remember where this quote comes from, but it's the general quote, science studies things that already are, and technology creates things that have never been. In some ways, like I was just saying, science and technology are reciprocal opposites. They each help each other and ratchet higher and higher. So for example, the James Webb Space Telescope could never exist without a lot of technology behind it. And the technology that produced this scientific instrument will give us scientific insights that could perhaps give us insight into new technologies. And based on that, if it gives us insight into new technologies, who knows what the next scientific instrument will be that's based on those new technologies. But we're constantly ratcheting upwards and upwards this is a relatively recent human realization. This is not something that Aristotle would have come up with back in his day. This is not something that um, St. Augustine would likely come up with. Um, maybe in the medieval period, they would have started noticing this, but if they did, they didn't talk about it very much. It's something that's kind of more of a subtext. But by the time you get to the Industrial Revolution, this is becoming pretty obvious, is that you can start making new scientific instruments. And yet, even then, the the understanding was more implicit rather than explicit in a lot of a lot of the time. All right. So technology, of course, has a relationship with power. Technical technological power gives us kind of very abstractly. It gives us a greater scope of action. In other words, it gives us more things that we're capable of doing. It gives us greater efficiency of action, which means that we can do the same things but more easily. And it gives us greater determinacy of outcome. This goes back to the uncertainty question which is that technology tries to make the world more certain uh, and gives us greater determination of the outcome. What's an example of greater scope of action? Humans in the past could not decide to build something like the Panama Canal. That's what this picture is in the background here. The Panama Canal is not something that probably anybody even thought about until we actually had the technological power to make it possible. And of course, technology gave us greater efficiency of action. It would be one thing to have the Panama Canal and have people try to dig it out by hand with shovels. That would be an incredibly difficult process. But if you have steam shovels and dynamite, all of a sudden it becomes much more practical. And it also gives greater determinacy of outcome, which is that um, even if there was a huge rainstorm or some big disaster struck, which damaged your equipment or caused a landslide or things like that, it doesn't matter that these bad things are happening you now have greater ability to control your outcome here because of your greater scope of action and your greater efficiency of action, you get greater determinacy of what's happening there. And uncertainty, all the uncertainty and chaos that life throws at you all of a sudden becomes less important because you have more power over it. So the purpose of technology is to facilitate human adaptation to a changing environment. And you, once again, go all the way back to Genesis, expulsion from Eden, technology steps in there. The environment has changed and humans can handle it. They can they can adapt to this change. Noah's Ark comes around once again, adapt to change. Something, a big disaster happens, but technology saves them from it. Exodus, they get a bunch of new religious obligations. Technology steps in to help fulfill those religious obligations. The Old Testament, it's a very technical religion. It's a very technology heavy religion. The idea of God being an artificer shows up in there as well. And in the New Testament, we get the idea of building or rebuilding the world. God is a carpenter. God dies in order to renew the world and set us on a new trajectory towards the future. And this all has a moral flavor to it. Uh, we are to, to adapt towards good and not towards evil when we are making this adaptation to our environment. And ultimately, the goal is to make ourselves fit to live with God in heaven. 
So technology can help us to express the image of God in us, but there's an if associated with that. It's if we use technology to actually fulfill God's mission for humankind. Uh, there's a conditional element to this, which is that we can very much choose to use technology for evil, but uh, hopefully we choose to use it for good. So all the way back to stone tools, fire, language, ritual, games, music, mathematics, the wheel, those are very old technologies. We often don't think about language being a technology, but it's probably the most important technology humans have ever come up with because it allows minds to communicate with each other. And through that communication, we become smarter than one individual. We can develop a culture and teach our young and all of those sorts of things. And of course, language leads directly into more complicated uh, abstract concepts such as mathematics, uh, even all the way down to computer languages that we have today. And those sorts of uh, very complicated statistical algorithms that permit uh, machine learning and uh, large language models and things like that. So one person who I love to use as an example, um, some of you have probably seen this slide before. And of course, if some, some of you have probably seen some of my presentations before and be like, oh, Brian's using some of the same slides. This is a slide that I reuse shamelessly because Norman Borlaug is such a wonderful example of taking, you know, feeding people to the next level, multiplying food to the next level. Uh, Norman Borlaug was a devoted Lutheran. He was an agronomist. So back in the 1950s and 60s, he discovered how to greatly increase grain production. It was not an intuitive process. What he discovered is that if you want to increase grain production, you have to dwarf the plant. And the reason that works is because if you have very heavy grains on a plant, the plant falls over. But if you add the dwarfing gene to it, it doesn't fall over anymore. It has a sturdier structure and does not just fall over because of the heavier grain production being produced out of it. It also prevents the plant from stretching to reach the sunlight because if it stretches, once again, it'll fall over. So this insight with dwarfing uh, these all sorts of plants, you know, it's you start with wheat, but you can go to rice, you can go to barley, you can go to rye, you can go to anything that you can dwarf, um, fundamentally changed agricultural production on Earth. And so he's credited with saving in an ongoing way billions of lives. Um, this is really kind of fascinating. Um, his 1970 Nobel Prize acceptance speech uh, directly cited the Bible five times, and it utilized biblical ideas throughout. And we can look at him and say, this is a guy, once again, uh, when Jesus said people are going to do these things and greater, this is something that he's a prime example of. It's just really, really, uh, I think, a wonderful example of someone taking the Bible and, and these sorts of ideas from directly from Jesus and, and really taking them to the next level, just as Jesus said would happen. So our purpose and power, um, our purpose in creation actually requires a certain amount of technological power. Uh, if we're going to care for each other, this requires a certain amount of knowledge. It requires construction technology. Uh, and of course, once again, the know-how and also the artifacts that are produced from it. Uh, food technology, medical technology, transportation, communication technology, all these big general areas of technology. Worshiping God requires a lot of technology. You have to build a large structure. Think of a Gothic cathedral, for example. There are textiles involved. You go back to, once again, the book of Exodus long descriptions of what the priestly robes are supposed to look like. It requires metallurgy. If you're going to make a stained glass window, you have to hold all those pieces of glass together with a metal framework. It requires writing if you're going to maintain a, a good knowledge of uh, what your you know holy books say, for example. You need to be able to make a book and write in it and write those things down. Uh, caring for nature, because that is one of the things that is passed to us. Uh, we are the stewards of the natural environment. So transportation, environmental science, computer modeling, economics, satellites, rocketry, all these things are involved if we're going to understand what's happening on the Earth and actually take care of the Earth. So technologies have purposes. Every technology has a built-in purpose. Every tech is know-how for something. So there's that know-how element, but it's always for something. Technologies don't exist in a vacuum. They're not for nothing. They're always for something. And we should really remind ourselves then that purposes can be good, they can be bad, they can be mixed, they can be neutral, and they can be ambiguous. Um, and all these technologies are imbued with human purposes, and they also direct us towards particular goals in a lot of ways, um, because they make those goals e easier. If you have certain types of tools, all of a sudden certain types of actions become easier. And when actions become easier, you are more likely to do them. So, for example, greatly expanded food production helps to feed the hungry. 
Antibiotics help to heal the sick. Mass production of clothing helps to clothe the needy. Aqueducts help to bring water to the thirsty. Hopefully you notice the corporeal works of mercy here, straight out of uh, the Bible, straight out of what is that, Matthew 25, I believe. And of course, you look at weapons of mass destruction. They make it very easy to harm or kill many, many people. And these are the things that technology permit us to do and make easier for us. When these things become easy, then we have to think about ourselves even more. Should we be doing these things or do we need to control ourselves better than we have been? The purpose of technology is to help adapt humanity towards its changing environment by facilitating good actions and impeding evil actions. That I really think is the ethical qualifier there. Um, we wanna make good actions easy. We wanna make bad actions difficult. And morality really takes priority over technology. Um, right now, of course, there's this massive technological impetus in society. Uh, there's lots of technologies being developed all the time, um, but their ethical aspect of it really should be the emphasis. We should not be developing technology without thought of how it will uh, affect the world in a very physical and concrete way. Technology should help us to become better people here on earth and ultimately help us to become fit for heaven. So the universal adapter, technology is a near universal adapter. Technology exists to help us. It can also fit us to the world badly. And that would be the, the ethically evil or bad side of these things. We make the world and then in turn, the world makes us because we're primarily cultural creatures. Uh, in a lot of ways, nature has been relegated to the background. We're in such urbanized or, or at least uh, human created environments now that nature, of course, is still there. We haven't taken complete control of nature, but tomorrow I'm just gonna you know, give a fun example in the, in the, at the conference tomorrow, saying that compared to the Greek gods, humans are way more powerful. Throwing lightning bolts at people is nothing compared to the amount of watts that humans have at our disposal. Um, we're, you know, two orders of magnitude beyond Zeus's, you know, ability to generate lightning bolts and throw them at people. Um, even if you gave Zeus the benefit of the doubt of giving him a billion bolts of lightning a year and each one's a billion joules, and that's approximately the right numbers, um, that's still two orders of magnitude less than the amount of electricity that humans produce. And so this brings us to the question of, you know, big blockbuster movie this summer with Oppenheimer. He was called the American Prometheus, bringing fire to earth. And we might ask ourselves, maybe a million times increase in human energetic uh, capacity or power, maybe that wasn't actually good. Um, you can go back to, ancient China, back sometime in the first millennium AD, anywhere, you know, there are estimates between the second century AD all the way up to about the 10th century AD, where alchemists generated uh, gunpowder in China. And so they came up with the idea of a chemical bomb, basically. They used it as firecrackers for the most part, you know, something nice. Um, but based on that, you know, all the way up into the 1800s, there became, you know, this idea of a ton of TNT. One ton of TNT has a defined uh, value in terms of calories of energy that are inside of it or joules of energy that are in it. So for thousands of years, all the way up until 1945, uh, that was the most energy that people had available to them in terms of a bomb. However, in 1945, thanks to Robert Oppenheimer right there, his picture, um, we figured out how to use those chemical explosives to set up something even more power, a thousand times more powerful. Uh, and so it had to be measured in kilotons of TNT. And of course, there's the Trinity explosion, and then the then Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and then starting to do experiments in the Marshall Islands with the Abel and Baker shots. And then just seven years later, Edward Teller, Edward Teller always viewed the fission bomb just as the trigger for his fusion bomb. Um, and he got another 1,000 times increase in energy from that. And it had to be measured in megatons, millions of tons of TNT. And so once again, I think to myself, you know what, if we didn't have these fissionable elements, if we didn't have uranium-235 and plutonium-239, then this actually would have been impossible. You can't go from chemical explosives to a fusion bomb. The step is too big. The intermediate step is actually necessary in order to make that happen. And so we might ask ourselves, why do we live in a universe with fissionable elements? And one thing also to think about the Manhattan Project, of course, is that the Manhattan Project was fundamentally driven by fear. 
which is, and this fear was that the Nazis were going to get the atomic bomb first. And so based on this fear, uh, the United States launched into this project. We benefited, of course, from having many, many physicists from Europe who came to the United States to work on this, whether they were from Hungary or from Germany or from England. Um, we benefited from all that knowledge here and developed uh, this weapon. And of course, once again, the fear was the Nazis already had ballistic missiles. If you attach an A-bomb to the ballistic missile, all of a sudden you've got a very terrible world. Um, but it was also essentially impossible. Research looking back at the Nazi bomb project basically showed that there wasn't really a Nazi bomb project. Um, they decided that it looked like it was too difficult. They didn't have an idea of how to put it together. They took one of their best physicists and put him on the Eastern Front to die as a foot soldier. Um, they really did not appreciate that this was even possible. Now, there's a lot of controversy around this. So I know that, for example, um, I think it's, uh, what's his name, Ellsberg. Um, I'm forgetting his first name right now. Uh, the guy who, who leaked the Pentagon Papers wrote a book called uh, The Doomsday Clock. And he said that Hitler actually disagreed with the idea of the atomic bomb because he was worried that it would ignite the atmosphere on fire. There's not a lot of evidence for that. I, he's the only person I've ever seen claim that. Um, and he does it in kind of a political way also, which is to make the United States look bad because we took the risk that Hitler wasn't willing to take. And that makes us, of course, worse than Hitler. Um, but there's not a lot of strong indication of that from a lot of a bit of research that I've done on this subject. It seems like the Nazis just didn't think it was possible or if it was possible, it wasn't going to be possible enough to be doing right now. They certainly didn't think that the Americans were going to be able to succeed at it. And of course, this motivation of fear, uh, the worst fears motivate the worst things. So atmospheric ignition was something that came up over and over again. If you watch the Oppenheimer movie, they talk about it there. Um, they can't rule it out. Enrico Fermi thought that the, per the percentage likelihood of atmospheric ignition happening was about 10%. So when they set off the Trinity bomb, he was not thinking that this was necessarily going to go well. Uh, thinking that the entire planet could be lit on fire, but they decided to do it anyway because they had this idea that, of course, it's better dead than what taken over by the Nazis. Or if you want to come up with a rhyme during the Cold War, better dead than red, which is something I remember from my childhood in the 1980s. So they decided to take the risk and do it anyway. And what happened, of course, is that all of the knowledge was immediately stolen by the Soviet Union so that within four years, they also had the bomb. And now nuclear proliferation has extended to all of the worst people in the world. We would certainly not want to have these things. If we didn't have fear driving us in the first place, it would have at least slowed this process down and maybe have resulted in a different world, maybe a better world. We can't know whether it would be a better world. Maybe it would be worse. But uh, this is the world that we live in now. So then we ask the question, of course, and this is fundamentally a, a, a theodicy question, right? Um, why did God let this happen? Why did God give us these two isotopes that acted as the possibility for making fission weapons and infusion weapons possible? Um, and we might go back and read, you, you, you know, God, we hear from, from Adam and Eve saying, uh, you must not eat from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you'll die. Uh, so there's something going on there. The fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Uh, I think we should look particularly at the good and evil aspect of that, not the knowledge aspect of it. And because when you're learning about good and evil, which is then empowered by technology, all of a sudden you're learning about good and evil at scales that were not possible in the past. So once again, uh, this is just my pondering. I wonder if if uranium-235 and plutonium-239 didn't need to exist. Um, so, <laughs> Bob, if you have thoughts on that, hit the end of the lecture by all means, let me know. But uh, that's the universe we live in anyway. Of course, there are other fissionable elements too. It's just that these two happen to be particularly easy to work with. Now, I lived for two years in the Marshall Islands, uh, right next to a U.S. military base. I was teaching high school to students on an, an island called Ebai, which has about uh, 12,000 people living on it. It's the, where the workers live, the, the indigenous workers who work on the U.S. military base on Kwajalein. And just north of Kwajalein and north of Ebai, where I lived, there was an island called Mech. And on Mech, they launch uh, Minutemen 3 missiles, basically, which are modified to be interceptors to hit other Minutemen 3 missiles that are being shot towards Kwajalein so the United States can have this massive experiment. And so this is something that I saw one night. This is not a picture of mine. I just found it on the internet. But uh, a Minuteman 3 reentry with three warheads coming in. It looks like comets streaking out of the sky. 
and it's very impressive. And you look at this and you, and you say, you can see them slowing down as they hit the atmosphere. They come in really fast and they immediately slow down and turn bright white. And then they disappear at the end of that. And so I come back to the United States and maybe, maybe about 10 years ago, um, I met a nuclear bomb designer who worked at Lawrence Livermore. And I, and, uh, and she, so she was literally one of the bomb engineers. And I told her, I saw a Minuteman three re-enter the atmosphere once. And I thought to myself, wow, is that, if that were real, I'd be dead. And she looked at me and she said, that's right. <laughs> and, uh, that's, you know, that's confidence in technology right there. Um, she, she, you know, that was her job and she wanted to make sure that those weapons actually worked. And uh, I am going to remember that quote for the rest of my life, <laughs> because that that idea, yes, you would be dead. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's just uh, it's such an eerie it's an eerie statement. And at the same time, it's true. It's obviously not false. Um, and yet there, there's something going on there that is, I think, worth pondering very deeply. All right. Moving on to space technology. So some of what we were just talking about in terms of of technology centered on nuclear weapons and then some of it on nuclear ballistic missiles. Um, but I think we should think about this fact that with space technology, if Earth's gravity was stronger or our atmosphere were thicker, rocketry would become more difficult. And depending on exactly how much that was, it could become very much more difficult. Um, the energy requirements might become too high uh, or it could at least become not economical because the payloads would become too low or reentry would become too hot. You'd be hitting a very thick atmosphere at a very fast rate. Um, this background picture here, though, shows that you can actually make heat shields out of some very interesting material. That's a heat shield made out of cork, which a uh, European country used on their CubeSat. So when the CubeSat reentered, they had a cork shield on it. Um, so of course, there are lots of opportunities to do these things uh, or come up with more complex or even simpler technology. In this case, cork is pretty simple. But uh, it all depends on on the uh, situation that we find ourselves in. So, I mean, at this point, we might think to ourselves, in order to get to the moon, you needed to have this Saturn V rocket, which is absolutely enormous. And the humans on this rocket were only way up at the top uh, in that tiny little cone up there just before the uh, very pointy part. All right, and we did manage to get all the way to the moon. And once again, you know, completely just the pinnacle of technology, um, even though it happened so long ago, um, you know, 50 years ago now, it's quite uh, amazing. So space and weaponry, Outer Space Treaty tries to keep space a peaceful place. But the same technologies that allow space travel allow us to destroy ourselves with nuclear ballistic missiles. And of course, there was a criticism of Werner von Braun, uh, you know, this is, I, I believe it was uh, what Tom Lehrer who made this joke in one of his songs. I aim for the stars, but sometimes I hit London. Uh, I'm Unfortunately, that could be the sad motto for humankind, right? We, we aim high, but for some reason we end up keep hitting each other. And this picture in the background here is just what a V2 rocket does to a neighborhood. You can see how it's knocked out houses in probably a 50 yard radius. All right. Moving towards AI, if you're going to talk about AI, you have to have the obligatory evil AI image. So here's a Terminator and here's Ultron. Um, but you also have to have, a, I think, a regular AI image now. Let's not be all hyped up on the movies. And, uh, you know, this is OpenAI's ChatGPT image, which they just put on their blog post when they introduced ChatGPT. So artificial intelligence, the thing is that it does what it asks, right? If it actually works, it does some pretty fascinating things. and. Uh, because it does what it asks, what we what we ask of it, we might ask ourselves whether we trust ourselves to ask the right things of it. And I would say this is just a very underappreciated risk, which I think is becoming a rapid, rapidly becoming a much more serious risk, um, which is that AI acts as a human substitute. It's one thing to have AI as a human substitute when it comes to working in a factory or driving around a car or things like that. But if it becomes a substitute in a relationship, there are already 2 million people. There's an app called Replica, which will give you an AI or an AI boyfriend or girlfriend. Um, they already have 2 million users and a quarter of a million of them are paying $70 a year for this service to have this AI girlfriend or boyfriend. This, if you could, you could see this potentially taking off and endangering human survival. Um, because what is this AI boyfriend or girlfriend going to do? It's gonna tell you exactly what you want to hear. It's going to be something that no other human can match up to. 
if you don't have a good conception of reality actually being better than artificiality. And so um, the video that these images came from was on TikTok. You can find it there. Um, technology is the subject is subject to the judgment of ethics. We really have to ask ourselves, artificial versus natural is, is an interesting distinction. Um, and but we have to ask ourselves exactly what is the nature of this distinction and how important is it? Um, now, this TikTok video purports to be an interview with someone. We have no idea whether this is verifiable or not. Is this interviewee real? But in the video, what it says is theoretically quoting this person, um, giving me a lot to think about, things like the nature of consciousness and what ultimately is real. But I've decided that ultimately that's irrelevant because I know what I feel and uh, I feel that this is real to me, real. <laughs> and uh, so we have to say to ourselves, is, is this fake reality that we're building actually a reality that is a good reality to live in? Um, and of course, we have to make that judgment for ourselves, but we actually might need to make a judgment for society as a whole, because if it starts turning out that, you know, 50% of people start having chatbot relationships, or 80% of people, 100% of people, um, of course, this is, means human extinction. That's it. It's over, right? So near-term versus long-term risk also. And also, it doesn't just have to be that, um, it doesn't have to be like an absolute sense either. It's just a relative sense, right? Which is that if one country accepts this kind of uh, diversion in terms of human attention towards artificial relationships, while another culture doesn't, guess who's going to replace the other culture over time? One group is going to outcompete the other, and then uh, that's uh, that's how evolution works. So there's a near-term versus long-term AI risk controversy going on right now, too. Um, the folks who are worried about risk right now and the folks who are worried about kind of more future risks, they're very an and have great animosity towards each other. And this has shown up in the UK summit, which recently happened. Uh, there is definitely some controversy where uh, these people were angry at each other there. And my response to that is, why not both? There's more than enough problems to think about. Um, these are just a few of them. Uh, you know, there's technical safety. There's the transparency problem. Can we actually understand it? Uh, surveillance, privacy, good use or bad use, uh, the non-diversity of the tech industry. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but some of them are very immediate threats that need to be addressed right now. And some of them are more longer term threats. And just because a longer term threat is longer term doesn't mean we should set it aside and wait for the threat to actually happen, right? Some of these things we should actually prepare for ahead of time. So preparing for, for example, artificial general intelligence, AGI, or super intelligence is something we need to be thinking about now. In some ways, these large language models are already super intelligent. It depends how you define intelligence. Just because they have access to a massive amount of knowledge and can produce it much more rapidly than any human can. They, of course, there's no understanding there. I would say that, uh, you know, AIs, we don't have to worry about them being conscious as they are right now. That's not a property that they are likely to have in any sense. There's no conceivable way of that happening, but I'll talk about that in uh, just a moment. All right. So if we want to think about what we need to protect about human nature, there are basically five things. And this is something that that uh, Thomas Aquinas talks about in just one paragraph in the Summa Theologia. He's like, of course, everyone knows that there are five things that we need to think about. We need to survive, reproduce, live in society, educate young, and seek the truth. And these you know, five basic things, they make pretty good sense, if you ask me. Uh, you have to, survival just means maintaining your existence in the short term. You need to stay alive. Reproduction means you're maintaining existence in the long term for your group. So it's kind of sustainable intergenerational continuity. Living in society means you need to maintain order and division of labor and things like that in order to fulfill the other five purposes in order to live in community here. Uh, you need to educate young. You need to convey the culture to them and all the necessary information they need in order for there to be a next generation. And then uh, you need to seek the truth. Uh, so keep those five purposes here kind of in proportion with reality. All right. So you can kind of demonstrate these by their opposite also, right? Which is that if you try to go extinct, people are going to look at you funny. Um, now, when you get to the reproduction question, uh, you have to recognize that these five values actually apply to groups. They don't apply to individuals. And we know that Aquinas thought that because he was a celibate priest. He did not reproduce. Um, on the other hand, so he says this is a property of groups, however. So that's one big thing to think about here is that these don't necessarily apply to every single individual, but any human group needs to maintain these five purposes. So 
uh, a group that chooses to go extinct, we'd look at them and say, why are you doing that? Uh, if they choose not to reproduce, I mean, we've had this happen, right, with the shakers uh, in our country. So some groups do choose to do that. They don't continue into the future. Uh, social isolationism causes a lot of problems in terms of, you know, people don't actually talk to each other. Division of labor doesn't happen. Um, people do live off as hermits in the woods, but they uh, tend not to uh, reproduce their culture in that way. Um, groups that reject learning, we look at them when they say, why are you rejecting learning? Or if they choose to intentionally believe falsehoods is another problem. And of course, all you have to do is look at the internet, flat earth, geocentrism, those sorts of things. And we would look at these and say, why is this group troubled? Why are they misguided? Are they weird? Are they crazy? Or are they actually doing something wrong? And when we look at this kind of evil question, we notice that, of course, if a group chooses to do it to itself, we say, OK, that's your choice. That's your, your autonomous choice. You can do these things. But if one group does it to another, then we say, OK, that's evil. If you're trying to drive a group extinct, like as the Nazis were doing at Auschwitz, which is the background picture here, then we say clearly there's something evil there. If you're forcing a group not to be able to reproduce, once again, evil. If you're isolating everyone into solitary confinement in a certain group of people, once again, there's an evil element to that. If you're preventing people from being educated or gaining any sort of uh, education, or if you're forcing people to believe falsehoods about the world, once again, there's something seriously wrong happening here. And you can do a reductio ad absurdum on this. Um, and it kind of consolidates down to three rules now. There's been kind of a consistent controversy on interpreting Aquinas on this point. Is there only one rule, which is survive, but survive long term because it kind of rolls all these things into one? Are there just three rules? Are there five rules? Uh, it's not at all clear, but uh, for this particular reductio ad absurdum, this will work. So first rule, don't go extinct. If you do the opposite, which is go extinct, go extinct, that's absurd. The logic is undercut. You can't do logical operations or make logical arguments if there are hum no humans are around to do them. So that's your reductio ad absurdum. The positive phrasing is that you want to seek sustainable survival, both intermediate and long term. Number two, don't live in isolation. Uh, if you choose to live in isolation, ultimately that's absurd because nobody can talk to each other. There's no communication. There's no reproduction. Um, and it, people once again go extinct. So um, this just shows that uh, once again, uh, logic can't happen. You can't make a logical argument if no humans are around to do it. And then the last one, don't seek falsehood. Um, the opposite of seeking falsehood was once again absurd or logically undercuts the whole endeavor because uh, you know, you're basically saying the logic doesn't matter anymore. How are you gonna make a logical argument in favor of absurdity? So of course the positive phrasing would be to seek the truth. All right, now we get to synthetic biology. Synthetic biology is a stronger form of biotechnology. It's more fundamental level of control where life is treated as a machine to engineer. And I'm gonna connect this back to what we were just talking about in a moment. So there are various varieties of synthetic bio. And it's often abbreviated as SynBio, which I think is kind of not a, you know, as a, as a Christian looking at it, you're like, hmm, SynBio, this doesn't sound quite right. But apparently there weren't enough Christians involved in shortening the name of the movement for it to uh, have an effect on what the name was. So it involves things like genetic manipulation, organoids, integration of machines and life, and something called synthetic biological intelligence, which has just popped up in the last, couple, in the last 18 months or so. Um, this is a picture of something called Dish Brain. Dish Brain is an electronic array which grows about a million neurons between 800,000 and 1.2 million neurons on an electronic array and then gets them to do things. It acts as a, as a computer processor, basically. This is what it looks like up close. Those are neurons spread across the electronic substrate. So Dish Brain, they take mouse or human neurons, uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, not embryonic, and they put it on this electronic substrate. And if you have a million neurons, you can train it to play Pong, which of course is one of the standard things that you wanna make sure something can do. Um, if it misses the ball, you give it an electric shock. <laughs> and uh, based on that, it learns over time that if it does not want to get an electric shock, it makes sure that the paddle is where the ball is going to be. So the neurons actually learn and respond and they act as the processor for this substrate. Um, what AI cannot do, synthetic biological intelligence actually might be able to do. So once again, here's my critique of AI. I don't see any way that AI can be conscious or that it can have its own volition or experience quality, qualia, uh, in other words, experience any qualities of existence, because these are all properties of living things fundamentally before they become properties of minds. 
um, and AI is not alive. Um, now, you might be able to argue it has some sort of metabolic intelligence or it could, uh, or, you know, electronic metabolism or something like that. I mean, there, there are other ways to talk about this, but I don't think it's going to be that way. That's my intuition is that it's not possible. However, synthetic biological intelligence is partly alive. Um, it might experience, have, it might actually have experience, you know, what is it like to be the neurons that are spread across that electronic substrate? It might actually want something or it might want nothing. It's hard to know, but life always tends to seek something. It has kind of this purpose built into it. If you take neurons and grow them on their own, I don't know how they're going to react. We'd have to see. Anyway, the living parts of these entities would seem to be at risk of being alive in a way which makes them more similar to human or animal intelligences. So we really need to think about this. Um, and we can also think that the human brain is 80 billion neurons approximately with 80 trillion uh, synapses as the connections. And so if you have a million neurons on a chip, you're still um, order of magnitude, you're 80,000 away from getting there, right? But also we should remember that uh, we're, it's actually most of the way there, right? If you start with one neuron and go up to a million and, you're, and your uh, human brain is 80 billion, then you're most of the order of magnitudes on the way there. And also this thing is likely to be much more efficient than a human mind because human minds have to do things like run your guts and make you walk and make you able to talk and all those other sorts of things. And this is going to be extremely specialized towards certain particular tasks. All right, so we have a universe of tools laid out in front of us. Um, God's given all these potencies in nature and in the universe for us to find and use for the sake of good, um, but also always at the same time with the risk of evil. So ethics now becomes more important than ever before. In the past, we were involuntarily constrained by our weakness. In other words, Humans could still do evil things, but they couldn't do evil things of the magnitude of evil. It's now very easy right now. So in the past, we were involuntarily constrained by our weakness. Now we need to learn to be voluntarily restrained by our own judgment, our ethics. We have to ask the question, should we or should we not? Now that can has become possible, we have to ask, what is the role of should? And power and efficiency. We need to learn to be efficient at good and inefficient at evil or we're going to come to live in a terrible world. Um, we don't want to be efficient at evil. <laughs> if we become efficient at evil, which we already have with a lot of weapon systems, um, things are going to be very risky. So we might ask ourselves, how can technology make good efficient and make bad or evil inefficient? And so back to Genesis and the long explanation. When handing the skin clothing to Adam and Eve, it's almost like God was setting us on a trajectory for humanity to where we are now. And of course, the story is a distillation of meaning. It's a, a myth is a, is a false story that tells something true. But uh, whoever wrote this story down evidently saw this kind of trajectory in history, perhaps already at this point. Um, and actually, they, they must have perceived this because they show that progression of technology in chapter four, uh, starting in, in chapter three and going into chapter four. There's an obvious progression in terms of technology over generations. So in that way, they actually noticed, um, which is a kind of a fundamental movement over time. Um, so we might ask ourselves, why did God ask the first couple to abstain, abstain from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Because um, tasting the tree could only mean one thing. If you're a parent and you tell your kids not to do something and then they do it, you have to give them an explanation. Um, and then ultimately with kind of a test at the end, otherwise who's actually gonna bother to learn it, right? So it's a very long explanation, millions of years long explanation, lecturing as a parent lectures a child. Uh, this world is the lecture. If we learn from the lecture, we get to return to an Edenic state, although it's not Eden as it was before. It's a new Jerusalem, the city of God, which is obviously very technological. And once again, we're accepting God's lecture. And if you wanna think of lecture in a different word, think of it as the word of God. Uh, if we ignore the lecture, we don't get to return to Eden. We just end up in fiery Gehenna, which is literally the way Jesus described it, right? It's the dump outside of Jerusalem. And that's not the right place to be, right? Technology is going to be the implement that gets us all thrown into the fiery dump. It's not a pretty picture. It's not a nice metaphor, um, but it is something to ponder. And of course, the antidote to the pride, to the vice of pride is humility. No one likes having to admit they were wrong. But if we can humble ourselves, then we can grow, we can learn. There's no learning without humility. Um, there's a recent former president who when asked if he had any faults or ways to improve himself said, 
I have no faults at all. There's nothing that I would do to improve myself. Um, that's not the example we want to follow. We want to follow the example of recognizing that we need to admit that we need to learn. There are things that, and ways that we can improve ourselves. So just a nice quote from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. I've set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. The last thing I would say is that God has a lot of faith in humanity. Um, ultimately, if you're looking at this sort of situation that we're in, God must think it's worth it. This goes back to the original question, right? Is it actually worth it? Well, apparently God thinks it's worth it. Uh, there's still goodness in human hearts. We still want a good future. We still want to love. We still want to seek the truth. And it must be worth the risk. Just like education is worth the risk. Just like love is worth the risk. Just like life is worth the risk. It might not be pretty, but it's always got. And it is a gift. And that's all. So I look forward to the conversation. I will stop sharing. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, I think since we're a fairly small group, if people just want to uh, use the raise your hand under the reactions, uh, we can try and, and manage things that way. just dumped like years and years of study into one presentation so <laughs> i'll take the silence as, as indication of oh so much to think about <laughs> thoughts anyone toby i see your hand is up Uh, was, yeah, are. thank you. Thank you so much. That was such an informative um, lecture, I'll say. I, I really enjoyed the scope and seeing, you know, how you transited from, uh, um, you know, across different areas, different applications of science and technology. Um, this may not be the most general of questions, but I was just wondering, um, as regards nuclear applications and um, weaponry, um, you spoke about uranium-235, plutonium-239, and it looked like the focus was, um, you know, this fissile radionuclides in their weapons grid enrichment, you know, and I was looking out for the nuclear power, you know, generation, which changes the enrichment profile. Mm -hmm. Usually for weapons grade um, applications, you want to enrich these radionuclides to like 90% right. fissionable and for nuclear power generation 20%, mm -hmm. which makes them, you know, which is a peaceful application, at mm -hmm. least till now in different parts of the world. And so looking at the peaceful um, uses of, of this radionuclides, will, they, will that change the question of why God created or why this primordial radionuclides exist since we have peaceful applications um, as well as the non-peaceful ones? Yeah, I, I mean, that's that's a great question. It's, it's I think we have to ask ourselves, of course, um, whether, you know, it's a balance, right? Is is uh, is the balance that we have from the peaceful application of these, you know, as an energy source, um, does that outweigh the the fact that we can use it, obviously, for terrible, horrible things? Um, and you're right, it's not an easy process either. The uranium enrichment process is very, very difficult. And the, it, it boggles my mind constantly to see how fast the Manhattan Project actually managed to create a bomb um, starting in 1942 and finishing in 1945, they managed to build an entire industrial infrastructure around these things. It was a really, really remarkable amount of human effort. And it was all for the sake of destruction. Um, now, of course, the destruction was gonna happen at the end, no matter what. Um, the destruction had already been going on for, for many years. And, and so it was, it was only gonna end in something horrible. But um, yeah, I, I think, some people talk about kind of the the progression of technology, whether there are defensive technologies and there, and there are kind of offensive technologies. And does the defensive technology keep up with the offensive technology? And I think that nuclear 
at least from my perspective, it looks like a technology that really just put offense so far out in front with a m 1 million times increase in destructive power that it's hard to see how um, the the uh, the defensive you know capabilities that might come along with with uh, normal peaceful power generation uh, would would uh, necessarily make it worth it. And of course, it's much more difficult to make a nuclear reactor than it is to make a bomb, which is another uh, kind of interesting thing. It, you know, nuclear weapons were invented in 1945, and it was you know several years before reactors uh, came to be actually uh, producing power in a in a in a good uh, way or in a useful yeah. way, I should say. Um, but yeah, Toby, I completely, <laughs> I sympathize with your, with your, uh, with your question because it is, it's, it's a, it's a, there, there's a good use to it, right? It's a, it's a fundamentally dual use technology. Um, and so we have to ask ourselves, uh, are we, are we able to use it in the way that it should be used? Yeah. And then, um, just on a final note from my end for now, you know, shifting the, the, um, dialogue away from the fusion process to the fusion, which <clears throat> is still in process. You know, it, it was just in 2022, in December, that the, the Lawrence Laboratory right. had a, a more recent breakthrough with, with the fusion. But this is a reaction that takes place naturally in the sun, mm -hmm. the helium-helium fusion reaction. And, and I think that is, that is the basis for us to be amazed that in the about um, let's say 90 years of, of um, nuclear technology, we're still trying to achieve sustainable fusion reaction, which is which has you know taken place in the sun for as long as you know um, the, the 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 solar system has existed. So I think this this has also a lot of theological implications. It's amazing that till now we are still trying to sustain a fusion reaction that takes place naturally in the sun, you know, ever since the origin of, of the world. I think that's um, amazing. It is. It's it's definitely worth pondering. The the technology is not simple. Um, it's and it's unfortunately it's much easier to create a weapon. You know, the weapon was created in 1952 with the Operation Ivy Mike shot. Um, and then we still haven't gotten the fusion power plant to work. So it just shows the orders of magnitude higher difficulty that's involved here. Yeah, you're exactly right. And and of course, start do it naturally. It's just the, the way the universe is constructed. All right, Peter. Thank you, Brian. Hello, Brian. Sorry, am I muted now? We can hear you. Okay. Um, I'm very concerned about the eventuality of a runaway greenhouse mm -hmm. if we're not able to bring um, global warming under control. And we seem to be doing very little in that regard. Do you have any optimism about uh, AI uh, being able to do an end run around uh, the human mind? I mean, uh, my son who's working in the field was telling me that that, that we've now short-circuited short uh, we, we've now sped up the ability to find um, multi-drug resist or, or, or to to do an end run around multi-drug resistant bacteria by finding new um, antibiotics. Um, is it too optimistic to think that AI may be able to pull a rabbit out of the hat and and reverse the runaway greenhouse? Yeah, this so that's a great question. What I would say is I'm not not sure that AI is the way that that would happen. Um, I because AI. Um, you know, it can help us think about things, I guess, is the way to describe it, right? It can help us model, it can help us, it can help us uh, come up with better answers, better solutions to the problems that we're finding. But it's not going to, I mean, unless we make one that's very persuasive, <laughs> just to persuade everyone in the world to do the right thing, um, which, of course, has its own kind of uh, ethical implications to it. Um, I'm not sure that, that AI is going to be the way to do it. However, um, what... And and this is this is my controversial opinion. I think that uh, geoengineering technology is going to end up getting deployed in some way, whether it's going to be mirrors and orbits, or just planting lots of trees. You know, there's a there's a vast different, vastly different amounts of, or different types of geoengineering technology that have been proposed. Whether it's iron fertilization of the oceans, also, um, and and uh, you know, stratospheric sulfur injection which is not which is something that people talk about a lot but i think is actually one of the worst options putting sulfur dioxide 
into the atmosphere like an artificial volcano. We have the technology to do that now, so it's possible. If we reached a tipping point where all of a sudden all the methane was boiling out of the permafrost and out from under the methane clathrates in the ocean and stuff like that, that might be the thing that we would have to do, right? Which is, is to actually use sulfur dioxide uh, as, as a reflecting, you know, increase the, the albedo of the atmosphere. So I think, I think there are technological solutions and I think we are going to skate ourselves right into them because we are not capable of making the right choices now that would be the easy right choices. And instead we're gonna go right into emergency situation. We need to, we need to do something now because that is unfortunately fundamentally the way humans solve problems is they wait for it to become an emergency and then they solve it. Now, that being said, there are examples in the past of humans actually making foresightful choices. The Montreal Protocols, for example, which banned you know, chlorofluorocarbons being a prime example of actually solving the ozone hole by, by getting an international agreement that worked. The Outer Space Treaty is also pretty good on this uh, side because the Outer Space Treaty was passed before humans had even gotten to the moon. So uh, people had already been into space because it was, I believe, 1967 that the treaty was written and 68 when it was ratified. Um, but there actually was a little bit of foresightfulness there. So humans are capable of it, but for some reason, the situation that we're in right now is greatly impeding that. And unless, unless <laughs> Facebook and Twitter and all the other social media platforms that are in charge of our information system decide that they wanna do the right thing, uh, we're just going to continue on making the same choices or worse ones, since I think our, our collective intelligence has probably decreased over the last 10 years. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And also thank you, Toby. I meant to say thank you. All right, let's go to Hyungju. Thank you, Brian, for your wonderful talk. Um, I'd like to uh, add a small, a further thought about the existence of uranium. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I think it, sh it should depend on uh, perspectives. However, we can inter we could interpret the existence of uranium as a necessary result uh, due to the um, um, existence of our universe as we know. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, our universe has a specific um, uh, property, physical property, um, which has a specific a uh, particle element and specific interaction between them, mm -hmm. and that led that eventually led to an exist the existence of hydrogen atom, mm -hmm. and also that led to the existence of more complicated atoms, including uranium. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, uranium um, could be interpreted as an element of, as a necessary element for our universe to exist in the in the way that we understand now and we see now. So I think that could be another perspective. Um, for the question whether the uranium um, is a necessary component for our universe or not. So, but again, that should depend on our perspectives. However, um, we can have that perspective as well. Yeah, and and I mean, I bring it up because it, it's, you know, God's all powerful, right? <laughs> so theoretically, it's it's possible. I mean, you know, these are these get into big theological questions, actually, as to whether God's all powerful in what ways God limited God itself in order to create the universe the way that it is. Um, and it's not it's not so much the element of uranium, it's that particular isotope, right? Uranium-235, that particular isotope. Um, and the fact that, you know, you can't make a bomb out of uranium-238, it doesn't work. Uh, there are other isotopes out there, you know, <laughs> just about every other isotope of any other element doesn't work for making a bomb. Um, it's those two there are a couple others that are likely, but I think there's one thorium that's a potential uh, bomb one. But it's it's uh, from what I've read about it, it's you know not an ideal way to do these sorts of things. So it seems like I don't I don't know how because I'm not God and I'm also not a very good physicist. I'm not a physicist at all. Um, <laughs> so this is mostly speculation, right? But it it uh, it's yeah those. The fact that those elements, that, and, and particularly that that uh, uranium-235 and plutonium-239 act as a bridge between chemical energy and fusion energy is just extremely suspicious to me. It looks like it's intentional. <laughs> I mean, it's the, the only way I can look at it, right? Um, and of course, humans are very prone to over-attributing in, 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 intent and all these other sorts of things. We have natural biases towards seeing things where things are not. 
Um, but uh, yeah, it's just so suspicious looking. It it uh, it looks like it's intentional, um, and especially because they don't come together in nature in that way either, right? This is something that only could happen if humans did it on purpose to use that chemical trigger for a fission trigger for a fusion trigger. That's never going to happen in nature. Um, so it's like I said, it's very suspicious. The entire universe is very suspicious, which is one of the reasons I believe in God. But uh, this particular one is just a, <laughs> it makes me wonder what, what exactly is going on here. Once again, it seems like God has an awful lot of faith in us. I'm not sure I have as much faith in humanity as God has. All right, Braden, I think your hand was up next. Thank you for the question, him too. Uh, yeah, you also have a question in the chat too, if you're able to to see oh, that. But uh, okay, I have sorry. a couple, uh, I have a couple just uh, short rapid fire things to to throw at you. So uh, first of all, again, I'm not a physicist either, either, and I hesitate to say this with so many physicists on the call, but uh, it seems that um, perhaps that it's entropy that you're really after, because I'm not sure that we would even have radioactive decay without uh, entropy. But I, I, again, I could be wrong. Uh, second of all, I think that uh, finitude seems to play a role in the discussion as well, and that I, I wonder if we would use technology in the same ways in terms of trying to harness efficiency if we weren't so concerned about not having enough. Um, and then third, uh, how do you keep from this type of argument being co-opted by uh, intelligent design perspectives? Oh, goodness. <laughs> well, let's see if I can. I, I have no idea how to handle the intelligent design perspective on that. Um, let's 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 try to go on them in order. So the first one is entropy, entropy, finitude and ID. So on the entropy side of things, um, I guess I would want a little bit of clarification. So you would say that that uh, things that radioactive decay exists because of entropy. Is that your argument? Yeah, but again, I, it's from a non-physicist, so it could be completely wrong. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I don't know if I know enough about physics physics to to answer that question either. Um, so, so I mean, entropy. I, there's, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. That's really complicated. I think I'm going to actually have to put that aside. Let's talk about it tomorrow at the conference. That seems like a good opportunity to talk about these things in person. Um, the next one was finitude. So I think you're right that finitude actually is a huge important thing here because it acts as a motivator of fear in a lot of ways. So, and, and we can see this very clearly with the transhumanist movement, which is that they are scared of their own finitude and they don't want to die. They want to extend their lives indefinitely, even knowing that entropy will eventually get them no matter what they do. Um, and of course there's all sorts of other problematic things going on there at the same time. Um, so so say more about finitude. Are you, are you thinking about it in that way or did you have a different perspective on it? Yeah, I, I, we don't need to go into it in a lot of detail because there are some other questions, but I, I, you know, I think that the fact that the, the myth talks about having to, to work hard to get the earth to, to, to bring things forth, mm -hmm. to eat, you know, to me that is already saying that life in the garden didn't have the kind of finitude that that mm. evolution requires in terms of you know competition and fighting for resources um again not that i'm saying there was a time before the fall but i think uh if we're trying to interpret the story in the way you've been telling us it seems that that scarcity and the the competition it, it creates between individuals uh certainly plays a role in in the development of technology okay yeah i understand now um, yeah, I think that's, that's, I mean, this is where every, every myth breaks eventually, right? Which is that the, the meaning is the most important part of a myth and the, the facts that are, that are building the story that convey the meaning are less important. So there's a lot going on there. And I mean, I, I, when I look at the first three chapters of Genesis, actually the, the first four chapters roughly, and think about the amount of data compression, the, the few number of words that are there and the incredible amount of meeting that are packed into them, it's just mind boggling in terms of the, the, the data compression um, and the interpretability and, and all those sorts of things. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure I wanna argue that there was a time before the fall where everything was fine and there was no competition and there was no finitude either. Um, because I think, I think once again, this gets into ideas of consciousness and recognition of the future and recognizing each other as fellow consciousnesses and all sorts of other stuff going on there too. 
but on the technological side of things, it's I, I think it's really, really um, obvious in the story. They're, they're trying to make an argument about how the expulsion from the garden resulted in God rewarding us with technology. It's just a, such a fascinating thing. Um, and yes, there's that condemnation to labor. Uh, you have to work hard. You have to work now in order to get things to, to to actually function. And of course, we see that with technological and scientific research. You have to work in order to make those things happen. If you want to get the knowledge, you have to put in centuries of work. Um, if you want to get the technology, centuries of work have had to be been done in order to get where we are today and produce the kind of society and infrastructure that we have in order to support the kind of society that we have. Um, I think <laughs> this really raises the question or the, the issue of gratitude also, which is like, we need to be particularly grateful to the world that's been handed over to us because they did not blow everything up, which they could have done. <laughs> um, and, you know, particularly in the last 70 years, but even going back further than that, things could be much worse than they are now. Things are actually uh, remarkably, you know, good, speaking from an optimistic perspective, <laughs> certainly not perfect. But uh, things can certainly be worse. We could have had a nuclear war sometime in the last 70 years. And particularly, you know, during the Cuban Missile Crisis would, was uh, an opportunity where there are at least four different points in that where they were going to actually push the button and didn't. Um, and then intelligent design. So, so when it comes to intelligent design, are you, are you making an argument that the universe is not as intelligently designed because these isotopes exist or that it is intelligently designed and that humans are just stupid? <laughs> that we use these isotopes in this particular way or something else. <laughs> well, I just think that the case that you're building, and again, we could talk about this more tomorrow, but the, I think the case that you're building in terms of the relationship between humans and technology and potentially even that these things seem to be presented in a way, you know, almost a fine tuning kind of argument mm -hmm. that, oh, well, the, the atmosphere is just in a way that we're able to escape. I can see an intelligent design person saying, yes, see that, that proves that God wants us to to travel to space. Um, yeah, so I, I, mean, I can, I can just imagine the kind of process you're working. It yeah. resonates with an intelligent design sort of way. Yeah, of this looking gets at the world. into all sorts of issues having to do with um, anthropic principle, right? That we can, we can only ask these questions because we live in a universe that created us so that we can ask these questions. Um, so, so if the atmosphere of the earth was more dense and gravity was higher, maybe we wouldn't exist. Um, if if there were no fissionable elements, maybe we wouldn't exist. Maybe the earth would have cooled off too fast and plate tectonics wouldn't happen and the entire surface of the earth would erode down and we'd be covered in water. Um, so there are these sorts of questions. I mean, that's, that's kind of why I look at uranium-235 because it is a major source of heat inside the earth um, and keeps plate tectonics running. Um, so, I mean, the fine fine tuning arguments are always vulnerable to the to the question of well, we wouldn't be here to ask the question. So, in that way, I kind of see it as like this is God's easy out, right? <laughs> it's like, see, you, you, it's still it's an argument for God's existence, but it's also you can get out of it pretty easily um, by just saying, yeah, you know, it's just the way things are, and if things were different, then we might not be here. All right, um, so. Braden, you were right that I think there's a question in the chat. I'm going to get the chest question in the chat, and then I want to go to Sandra. Um, so is it necessary to justify or clarify our ethical positions regarding technological development with help of the idea with the help of the idea of God? As you cited different texts to show that we have freedom to choose between good and evil, I would like to ask that we are that are we aiming to at revisiting our ethical concerns through our literature and art? So th that, I think, is definitely right. There's a lot of literature and art that are focused on these ethical concerns, and especially as they relate to technology, for example, Frankenstein, or all sorts of science fiction or fantasy stories. Look at The Lord of the Rings, for example. The One Ring is kind of a distillation of technology, and there's been, you know, there have been examples of philosophers of some technology looking at The Lord of the Rings and saying that the One Ring represents technology, you know, in general, maybe a specific technology, um, but it raises a question of maybe some things should not be made. And that's a question that we have to ask ourselves. And also the, the idea of externalizing power. If we externalize the power, we give up, we lose control over it. If it's in our minds, we at least have control over the idea in our mind. But if we put it out there, then guess what? The Russians steal it within you know a few days of the ideas coming up because that's what they discovered in the Manhattan Project. They literally were getting the plans for the atomic bombs within just a few days of the, of the things, the ideas coming up. Um, let's see, anything else in that question that I missed? Um, 
re aiming at revisiting our ethical concerns. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think there are fantastic examples of us using technology for good purposes. And, and uh, we do that with medical technology all the time, with communications technology, with transportation technology. The fact that we can have this over Zoom right now is amazing. I am, I'm technically just talking to an inanimate piece of, you know, electronics sitting in front of me right now. And yet all of you can hear what I'm saying and you can understand what's going on in my mind as we communicate back and forth. Um, and that's just amazing. That's, that's something that wasn't possible even just a few years ago, at least at the scale that it's used now. All right, I see a hand up from Sandra. Thank you, Brian, for your far ranging presentation. My question is that since you like to use biblical texts to make arguments about the present, what do you think about promoting the Babylonian captivity as a model for us? I'm thinking about these points in particular. First, the people were iniquitous by turning away from the Lord and turning towards their own heart's desires, which were sinful. And we've done the same with secularism. Uh, second, the earth languished during the time leading up to the Babylonian captivity because the Israelites had stopped caring for it. Third, the Lord has been known to be slow to anger and yet quick to rebuke. And we saw, and that certainly happened then. Fourth, Jeremiah prophesied for 20 years before Jerusalem was attacked the first time and 20 years before it was destroyed um, or finally destroyed, so slow to anger. And Jeremiah identified the people of his generation as continuing their forebears' iniquities and offering them an opportunity to change their ways, which they rejected. And fifth, we seem to fit a have been repeating this narrative. So their story ended with collapse of the civilization and nature took control back for a few generations until the survivors were ready to start fresh again as God's people. If we use this as a model, the solution is to turn away from our own desires, that is science and technology, and to turn back to God and accept a nature that we choose not to control to a great degree. So if we choose to stop controlling nature to such a great degree, then we might have an increased likelihood of saving the environment. What do you think? So I'll, I, I can't disagree with most of the things you just said. <laughs> Unfortunately, this has crossed my mind, which is that, you know, something big and bad will happen and will set us back. And then uh, hopefully, um, you know, after a certain period of time, maybe things will go back to, you know, a, a more uh, normal state or or perhaps a better state. Um, so yeah, I think what you just described there is is something that we should absolutely keep in mind because stumbling and having bad things happen to you is absolutely possible. Um, one thing that you mentioned when you mentioned Babylon is that you actually reminded me of the Tower of Babel. And of course, one of the interesting things happening right now with social media is I think we're actually recapitulating the Tower of Babel, but with meaning instead of words. And so all these narratives are going out there. We're all using the same words. We have the same language and we can talk to each other, but we actually can't talk to each other anymore because we have such different evidence that we're operating upon and such different presuppositions about how the world works that we can't, we can't communicate anymore. And so you have people who are following QAnon and you have people who are following other very, very different um, things. And so, so we're living in the Tower of Babel uh, over again because we've done it to ourselves. Um, and that's fundamentally, I think, one of the things one of the things God says with the flood is that God will never again destroy the earth with a flood. Um, doesn't say anything about humans not doing it. Doesn't say anything about using some other method to do it, like fire or I don't know, you know, name your pick your pick your disaster. Um, and when it comes to the environmental issue and and letting you know the environment be restored. Um, what I would say is that, gosh, there's a better way to do it, right? Which would just be to do the right environmental stuff in the first place, um, rather than waiting for, for something disastrous to happen to set us back in order to help the environment recover. We could actually choose to promote technologies, which are good technologies that help the environment, and limit technologies that are bad technologies that harm the environment. So we're really, we're really in this position where we have the power and we don't recognize the power a lot of the time either. We don't recognize that, for example, um, 
look at the 9.0 earthquake that happened in Japan back in, what was it, 2011, 2013? I can't remember exactly when. Um, that 9.0 earthquake made the skyscrapers in Tokyo sway back and forth. And you can watch them swaying back and forth. There are videos of them. They're going, you know, several feet back and forth at different oscillation, you know, times. And sometimes they get close to each other and sometimes they get farther apart. And you think to yourself, wow, those skyscrapers actually survived a 9.0 earthquake. There was a lot of Japan that was heavily damaged by it, but those skyscrapers survived. Um, here in California, we don't, I don't think we engineer that well, actually. Um, you know, when we, we haven't had an earthquake in a long time, you know, thank God. Um, you know, knock on wood and everything else that you can <laughs> say to hopefully uh, make things turn right. But um, when we have a big earthquake in California, I have, maybe our skyscrapers will be just as strong, but we also don't get 9.0 earthquakes. So I don't think they're engineered to withstand that. Um, and when they designed the new Bay Bridge, for example, I believe they only engineered for up to seven and a half or something like that, which is actually not good enough. Um, so, so even when we know that things might go wrong, we still don't necessarily prepare for them. Even when we see the train coming towards us, we still don't get off the track. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's my kind of issue with this. And we're going to talk more about this tomorrow at, at the, at the conference. So thank you for that question. All right. Looks like Adrian, you're next. Well, thank you, Brian, for a fantastic lecture. I really enjoyed, uh, the whole sweep of that. And it was a broad sweep. Um, would love to ask about your definition uh of the living things and the synthetic biology but i want to actually go back to this the discussion that's already happened a little bit um perhaps you'll clarify this tomorrow about whether we can assess that the nature that we're given including uh, uh fissile materials uh can be assessed by us as being wrong like mm -hmm. uh, it, it sounds um uh the way you presented it at least it sounds like you could sort of come to the conclusion that like you'd prefer physics to be a bit different in this world <laughs> because because it is just too easy to make a bomb and uh i'm not so sure that you really would defend that but i would love to know in detail whether that was just in service of a of an enjoyable lecture or whether you think that's a defensible position um as you were, as that came across, my default position uh, is that it's just too difficult to really draw a final end of time conclusion on whether we'd be better off without a fissile material or not. Um, and I think that's true of all questions of technology, just because the dual use argument is just so difficult to conclude. Conclude, we just don't know until the end of time whether we'd be better off. Um, so I don't think you, my starting position is that you, you can't say whether this configuration of nature is, 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 could be improved. However, within the, the, the Christian scheme, we have a concept of a, a new creation where we do have things which will be different. And as you say, like no decay and the rest of it. And, um, I would, I, I would love to know more about how we could talk about that because and and how that might affect the possibility of I mean would it be a more restrictive creation where we don't have the ability to make nuclear bombs things like that I'm not sure if you're going to cover any of that tomorrow but um yeah that's that's a very interesting uh area I'm just gonna have to think a ton about more but thank you again yeah, yeah so that that's great and and what I would say is I don't know right this is fundamentally very speculative it's like Guess what? I don't know physics better than God. I don't even know physics as good as as uh, you know anybody who calls himself a physicist probably. So, so in that way, yes, it's very speculative. But but um, I I do wonder, right? It's it it's it's something that provokes. It's a provocative thought, I guess. And so when I talk about, I'm going to talk about these you know technology of provocations for theology and ethics tomorrow. Um, that's, I think, fundamentally one of the things that we have to do here, which is have our thoughts provoked so that we can figure out how to respond to them. Because I think we can learn a lot about ourselves, about the universe that we live in, and ultimately about God. And I think God, uh, you know, God God gives us a lot of freedom. 
And that freedom is something that can be abused. It's something that we can ab absolutely use wrongly. And we have to um, really have to, we have to figure out how to, how to make ourselves worthy of the freedom that's been granted to us. Because if we do it wrong, it, it will uh, absolutely come back and bite us. I don't know. If, I, you had a lot of questions in there, so I don't know if I answered all of them. <laughs> yes, that was fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, I think Peter, you have your hand up. Did you did you want to ask another question, or is your hand uh, just up from last time? All right. Looks like Peter might be having some. I think that was maybe just a dismissive no, but uh oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. In that case, I see. Oh, Hyungju has a question here. Uh to add one more sentence as a response to your answer, it might be interesting to think about this issue. Our universe is a universe which allows isotopes of uranium. Uh was it avoidable for our universe or was it a necessary output for our universe to have such ideal conditions for creatures, including ourselves? Yeah, I mean that is that is the question ultimately, um, and and I would say also I'm making an assumption here that nuclear weapons are intrinsically evil, but um, there's another way to phrase them, and that's you know that's my Catholic background because the the Catholic Church is at least uh, Pope Francis has kind of been making that argument recently, um, and it's 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 reasonable in some ways, but it might might not be completely reasonable, which is that for example if we had a very large asteroid headed towards the Earth, we might want to have a 100 megaton bomb in order to hit it with and try to knock it off course. Uh, and, you know, maybe nuclear weapons end up being salvific for us in that way, right? Um, and so we have to ask ourselves, maybe once again, the staging looks suspicious. The fact that you can go from one to a thousand to a million um, and that that uh, that technological possibility is very clearly there. Um, Maybe maybe we've just been using nuclear weapons for the wrong things. Maybe we shouldn't classify them as weapons. That's the other thing, right? Um, uh, one of the one of the ways that the Catholic Church uh, makes sure that that uh, you can call something intrinsically evil is by defining it, right? If it's a nuclear weapon, then it's defined as intrinsically evil because it's designed for acts of genocide, basically mass indiscriminate killing. Um, on the other hand, if you called it a nuclear device. <laughs> and you said the purpose of this nuclear device is to divert asteroids away from hitting the earth then all of a sudden you put it in a different category it's no longer intended towards uh intrinsically evil act of genocide it's instead uh, directed towards uh you know preventing genocide and maybe it's you know ultimately what it comes down to is that uh, these very very powerful tools that we have can be used correctly and incorrectly um, and for some reason, we just seem to find the incorrect uses to be so irresistible. Um, all right. And let's see. Oh, Braden has one there. Uh, trolley dilemma. Dilemma. People won't get off the track. Yeah. You know what? <laughs> yeah. Mostly in jest. But uh, please uh, join me, everybody. And uh, and thank you, Brian, uh, you know, for this great, great talk tonight. Um, and if you'd like to hear more, uh, again, we'll be hybrid uh, tomorrow from noon to five. Um, so you can go to uh, ctns.org uh, if you want some more information, or uh, if you have a question, you can stick around after we're done here. But uh, yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for a great lecture. Thank you, Braden. This has been a lot of fun, and thank you to all of you who are here. I think this was this was a fun conversation. I really enjoyed the the question and answer part of this. You're you're right on target with all of your questions, so I, I really enjoyed it, and uh, I look forward to hopefully seeing most of you tomorrow. <laughs>